Hi and welcome to masterclass on carabiners. A lot of us like to treat these as indestructible magic, which is only partially true. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how this carabiner could fail under normal climbing conditions on forces that are lower than what these ratings say. I'm also gonna explain why there is so many different shapes and sizes and features and everything you need to know about carabiners so that the next time you go to a climbing shop you would not get lost in all that vast amount of choices and in some cases uh, the salesman's pitch. Most of carabiners that are used in sport climbing are made out of aluminium or to be more precise aluminium alloy which means that aluminium is mixed with other elements. That. But that's only for my geeky viewers. Under normal conditions this metal is super resistant to corrosion and gonna last you forever. However you need to be cautious if you're using it next to the sea because longer exposure to a salty water might still damage it. And if you're one of these smart people who asked why isn't aluminium resistant to corrosion then the answer for you is yes it is, however this is alloy mixed with these elements and long story short wash it if it gets in contact with salt. And long story long in video description. Then we have carabiners made out of steel. They are much stronger but also much much heavier so you won't be carrying them on your harness. They are mainly used in advanced rigging situations or fixed equipment. So don't make a mistake and buy them for your climbing. Sometimes you might hear that the carabiner is hot forged. You can safely ignore this as a marketing label because every carabiner which has a little bit more intricate shape will be hot forged no matter if the manufacturer mentions it or not. Forging is basically a process of shaping or removing the metal and it can be done hot or cold or warm and the main goal is to remove parts of the carabiner that are not contributing to strength to make it lighter or to shape it in some ways that make it more ergonomic. So this carabiner has a lot of intricate shapes and it's definitely hot forged. While this carabiner as you can see is completely smooth and round and it seems that they just took a bar of aluminium and bend to have this shape. Okay now why do we have so many different shapes of carabiners? Originally carabiners were made oval like this. But very quickly manufacturers realized that if you shape a carabiner more like a D that will shift the load closer to its spine which is the strongest part of the carabiner and that way you can remove some of the carabiner's material make it lighter but equally as strong in the optimal loading direction. So most of the carabiners that you will be using will be more or less like a D shape while ovals still have some use in some rear situations because they have very nice round big opening. For example if I have my stick clip and I try to clip my D-shaped carabiner it doesn't really want to function that well as a nice old oval shaped carabiner. I can flip it easily in any way I want. Works well. Okay, next we have carabiners that are shaped like a pear. And they are often labeled as HMS carabiners, which comes from a German word that I have trouble pronouncing. Halbmaschwurfsicherung? So what that means is that this carabiner is good to be used with Munter's hitch knot. I will talk about knots in another episode, but now just to give you some context, Munter's hitch is used mainly in emergency situations in case you dropped your belaying device and you need to belay somebody or repel down. And since this knot needs space to flip when you are operating it, it works much better with big and smooth carabiners. So that's why these carabiners are called HMS carabiners. Basically this historical reason of this hitch. 
Also, since HMS carabiners have nice, big and smooth top, they are often used with belaying devices. And in addition to the nice round top, some of the HMS carabiners will have a little loop here. And what it does, it prevents the carabiner from twisting sideways and loading in less than optimal angle. You will find different designs of this loop. For example, this is spring loaded. I've used this carabiner for quite a long time and I was pretty happy with it. It's pretty easy to operate. One downside is that sometimes you might forget that spring and if you clip it and forget about it, you might actually break that spring. Some brands do that spring operation in reverse, so even if you forget that spring and you take a fall, it will just clip itself. Then removing it's a little bit more effort. Now Black Diamond has a slightly different design where by opening the gate you're also opening this little loop here. If you have a harness with narrow belay loop, it works really well because all you need to do is just pull and it sits in its place. And when you open, it's quite easy to operate. However, if your belay loop is a little bit more thick, this mechanism tends to jam sometimes. For example, yeah. So not ideal, I would say. And then Hana Banana said to me, hey, try Mammoth's cross lock. This thing. This thing is actually really smartly designed. It's spring loaded, but it's loaded both ways. So that means that it's very easy to put it in. It cannot cross load and it's very easy to take it out. So I have to say, well done Mammoth on this design. Really smart. And the last shape I wanted to talk about is this which is technically not a carabiner, it's called a quick link and it's used in anchors to connect chains with rings and stuff like that. However, you will find that some climbers will carry these things on their harnesses. That's in case if they cannot finish the route, they would leave this on a bolt and would repel down of it. I don't recommend doing this, I will make a separate episode of what to do if you cannot finish the route. And honestly, in many years of climbing, I never left a piece of gear on any sport climbing route. It could happen, it's super rare, but in that case, I would just leave an old carabiner or old piece of quick draw that I don't care too much. And carrying a heavy piece of metal on every single climb is definitely stupid. Okay, let's talk about the gate of the carabiner, which can be locking or non-locking. Non-locking carabiners are typically used in quick draws. You can find solid straight gate or solid bend gate. The straight gate usually goes to the bolt, while the slight bend in the gate helps to clip the rope. And then we have carabiners with wire gates or something like this, skinny petzl wire gate. These are lighter but clipping them feels a little bit different and some people don't like it, some people don't mind it. So it's just a question of taste. However, what you should definitely avoid is carabiners that have this hook on the nose. This is quite old design and it's really annoying. What can happen is that when you're trying to unclip a rope, it gets stuck. Or you're trying to unclip a carabiner from the bolt and this nose hook just gets in your way. So avoid these. If you choose to use wire gate carabiners, look for ones that have so-called key lock feature. It's basically a hookless nose. Non-locking carabiners are equally as strong as locking ones when the gate is closed. However, it's very easy to open the gate and then the string gets compromised and it can actually unclip very easily. So. If the only thing you have is non-locking carabiners and your life is at stake, you can use two of them with the gates facing away from each other. However, you should be cautious how you're clipping them. For example, if I would clip like this, the gates are facing away from each other, but if something would happen and one of them would twist around, now suddenly both gates can be opened from the same side which is bad. So to avoid that, clip one of them 
and then when you're clipping the second one make sure that the white side matches the white side of the other carabiner in my case I want the other carabiner to be like this so if I flip one of them now the gates will open in this pattern which is impossible to take the rope out this is much safer all right let's talk about locking carabiner starting from the classic screw gate which is super safe if you don't forget to screw it one nice feature that some of these carabiners have is a red or orange indicator that you didn't screw the carabiner yet and once you screw it that indicator disappears when screwing these carabiners, don't screw too tight. If there is a heavy load, you might have trouble unscrewing it later. <laughs> also, if sand or dust gets inside the thread, you might have the same problem. What sometimes helps is to take a little rock and just gently tap the gate to loosen it up. Or you can wrap something like a sling or a rope around the gate to have bigger leverage and that sometimes helps to open it. And of course, if your gate has sand or dust inside, you have to clean it and lubricate it to prevent such problems. All right, next we have auto locking carabiners that lock themselves once you close them. This one is so-called double action auto locking carabiner, meaning you need two actions to open it. In this case, you need to twist it and then open it. Because this is only two action carabiner, you should not rely on a single one of these because it's quite easy to accidentally open it. It's still safer than non-locking carabiner, but if you want to rely on single auto-locking carabiner, you should find a one which has triple action gate, meaning you need to push up the gate, twist and open. This is super safe, it's very hard to open it accidentally. The downside of these triple action carabiners is that they are quite difficult to operate, especially for the people who are not used to them. And the best way to do this is to push the carabiner against something while you're pushing the gate up, then twist the gate, then open the carabiner. You can push against yourself if you want, because doing it with one hand is not easy at all. So while triple lock carabiners get rid of the human error problem, they tend to be a little bit more heavy and they are more difficult to operate. For example, if I want to build an anchor, it's much easier to do this with screw gate carabiners. The gate is still not closed yet, it's very easy to clip a sling. And now I can close both of them easily and continue building my anchor. If I would try to do the same with locking carabiner. Now in order for me to clip the sling to this carabiner, I need somehow to open the gate. And as we know, it's not always that easy to open a triple lock carabiner. So it works, but it's much easier with screw gate carabiners. Now, every carabiner, which is sold for climbing, independently of its size, needs to match certain strength requirements, which I'm gonna talk a little bit later in this video. But what it means that even this tiny carabiner is strong enough to be used in climbing. So in situations where weight matters, choosing small carabiners, you can save a lot of weight. However, the smaller the carabiner is, the harder it is to operate it especially if you have big hands, which I don't, so for me it's still usable. For example, this carabiner has a tiny gate opening space and while clipping to the bolt, you need to be very precise. While in contrast, if you have big gate opening, it's much easier to put it to the bolt. Plus in situations where you can barely reach the bolt, the bigger carabiner you might still be able to clip, while the smaller one will be more tricky to reach. And this is a very good example where you might choose a very big carabiner. It's as a master point for your anchor, where smaller screw gate carabiners work very well to connect to the bolts. 
you might choose to have a bigger carabiner for your center point. It has more space to connect multiple things and it's also a little bit stronger. It's rated a little bit more. Okay, let's move on to something a little bit more fun. The strength of the carabiners. As I already mentioned, properly used carabiners are indestructible. However, used improperly, they might be surprisingly easy to break. If you look into any carabiner which is made for climbing, you should find strength ratings somewhere on the spine of that carabiner. The first number indicates the strength of the carabiner when the carabiner is pulled along its long axis. The second number indicates the strength when the carabiner is cross-loaded. And the third number indicates the strength when it's loaded along its long axis, however the gate is opened. Okay, so what? For these numbers to make any sense, we need to understand what forces are involved in real climbing situations. And I've already made a video explaining a lot of that, so if you haven't watched it, I recommend to watch it later. But for now what matters is that an average lead climbing fall will generate about 2 kN of force or about 4 kN in some really exceptionally hard falls. Now these 4 kN is the force to the climber's harness. What's more interesting for us is the force to the top piece of the gear that the climber is falling on. So let's imagine the worst case scenario. Let's assume that this is our belayer and the climber climbs above this piece of gear and takes super hard catch of 4 kN of force and then the question is what's the force to this piece of gear? So what we have here is actually very inefficient pulley. This is a more efficient pulley. Now the only thing you need to know about pulleys is that they redirect the force. So if I pull on this side of the rope the tension on the other side of the rope will be the same. So if the climber falls and there is 4 kN pulling here, there will be 4 kN pulling here. And 4 plus 4 means that this carabiner will see 8 kN of force. Now in real life scenarios, during the fall, the belayer will move up. And that greatly reduces the forces on entire system. And here is a video from Petzl. And the result was that 4 kN of force to the climber resulted into 6 kN of force to the top piece of the gear. So 6 kN to the top piece of gear on super hard fall which is super rare to generate in real life scenarios. And since every carabiner needs to be stronger than 20 kN when it's pulled along its long axis, this one is rated for 26 it's literally impossible to break it. Even if you somehow manage to cross load a carabiner and wait, yeah, it's not that easy to cross load a carabiner to begin with. Let's try again. So if you manage to take really hard fall on a cross loaded carabiner, it still should survive. Because the force, as we said, 6 kN is super rare already. And according to the standards, every carabiner should hold at least 7 kN in cross load situation. For example, this one says that it holds 9 kN in cross load situation. So it's literally impossible to break this carabiner. Personally, I know only one case scenario where a cross loaded carabiner was broken. In this picture, they just put the gate back but actually the entire gate was ripped off the carabiner. So the takeaway is if you see your carabiner is cross-loaded, fix it, but there is no need to panic because the chances of breaking it is like being hit by a lightning, especially if that happens on your belay carabiner. During this hard fall that we talked already about, the force to the belayer was only 2 kN and that's more than 3 times lower than the breaking strength of any carabiner being cross-loaded. So there's totally no need to panic if you see Belair's carabiner being cross-loaded. However, I still like to use these belay carabiners with extra loop because they give me certainty of the orientation of my carabiner and it's just less things to worry about.
All right, now a fun quiz. How much a carabiner clipped like that will hold? Is it open gate strength? Because the gate is opened. Initially, I thought it will be like that. However, open gate strength is when you load the carabiner along its long axis and open the gate. When you place it like this, it's called a nose hook. According to Black Diamond, nose hooked carabiners can fail at 10% of their maximum rating, which is crazy. And here is a video from DMM, where a nose hooked carabiner broke between 3 and 4 kilonewtons. That's the force that you can already generate on very hard whipper. And that's another reason to avoid carabiners with this nose hook because this problem is possible only on these carabiners. If I try to do the same with the carabiner, which has a key lock feature, like so, during the fall, it would flip to its proper orientation. So it's not a problem. All right, here's another quiz. Imagine a carabiner being bent over the edge which can happen if the bolt is placed in a bad position or maybe you're placing your own protection and suddenly your carabiner is being pressed against the rock. So unfortunately carabiners don't have ratings for these things and it would be pretty hard to make a rating for this misuse of the carabiner. So I messaged my friend Ryan from YouTube channel how not to highline because he likes breaking stuff and I asked them to break some carabiners in this misuse case. So how much weakened the carabiner is will depend on the leverage. For example, in this case, the carabiner broke around three kilonewtons only. Oh, ho, ho. that's not very high. That is a force you can see when you're climbing. So if you encounter such situation in real life, the solution could be using longer quick draw or using a longer sling to make sure that the carabiner is overhanging the edge of the rock. All right, another quiz for you. How much will this black carabiner hold on huge force downwards? Normally, carabiners are not designed to be pulled in multiple directions. So how bad is this? Well, Ryan? It's really fun to have internet friends who are willing to break their equipment every time I ask. 15.75 being 50 to 60 percent somewhere in there that is pretty low now let's turn it around and see what happens if we use the wide side of the pair so we're getting a consistent result that the wider side of the pair is lower so after he broke a bunch of carabiners the results mostly dependent on this angle and one more interesting thing is that pulling a carabiner like this, where you have two forces on a wide side of the carabiner, was much worse than pulling like this, where you have two forces on a narrow side. My assumption is that since the nose of the carabiner is the weakest point of the carabiner, as we talked before already, this creates a disadvantage compared to doing this. Now, such setup is not gonna kill you, however, there is absolutely no need to do this and I will talk about proper anchor building in the future episodes, so don't do this. So to sum up, load it in a proper orientation without twists or bends or presses against something, carabiners are literally unbreakable. However, if you're doing something else, you might have some surprises. Now, assuming a proper use, how long does the carabiner last? Since aluminum alloy doesn't degrade on itself, it all will depend on the usage. For example, this little screw gate that you might use in your anchor buildings might last you forever. And carabiners that see constant friction over them, for example, in quick draws or belay carabiners, will develop grooves over time. 
Now just a light paint loss is completely normal and for example this Petzl carabiner I used for maybe a few climbing sessions and in this part where the rope goes there is already no paint left. However over a longer period of time the groove might get so deep that it becomes sharp and it's actually not good for your rope. So a small groove is not a problem, however check if there is nothing sharp on any parts that get in contact with your rope. Another possible failure is when the gate stops closing properly, like this. And now I cannot even open it, so... Yeah, this is already bad. Sometimes you can fix it by cleaning and lubricating it, and if not, it's time to retire such carabiner. And in general, when checking a carabiner, just ask yourself, does it give you confidence? Check for cracks or deformation, and also if the gate is working properly. While small scratches are totally fine. If you drop your carabiner to the ground, can you still use it? Most of the people who ask this question probably heard about so-called micro-fractures. Now this is just my personal opinion and you should always listen to what manufacturers recommend, but I don't think that micro-fractures is a problem for aluminum carabiners. While for steel it could be, because steel is more hard metal and it's more brittle. Also I was very entertained watching another Ryan's video where he tested this myth by smashing his quick draws to the ground really really hard many many times. Something that really bothers me is the fact that I was told that doing that well, you'd have to retire your carabiner. Basically a microfracture is a crack in the aluminum you're technically not able to see. That's a lot of fun. And then breaking them on his brake machine and none of the carabiners broke under 20 kilonewtons. So it's kind of a myth. So as a general rule of mine, if I see a carabiner falling from the top of really long route and hitting the rock really hard, then I might consider retiring this carabiner. However, on anything else, I would just take the carabiner, inspect it. If there is no visible damage, I would still use it. But I take no responsibility if your inspection is really bad and you get hurt by this advice. So listen to what manufacturers recommend. And final bonus question. Was this video useful for you? If it was, then you should share it with your friends. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for watching. I have something in my eye and I have something behind me which is a lot of mammoth gear that you probably seen in this video already and that's because I reached out to them and asked if they could help me to produce this course and I'm super happy that they agreed. So I have a lot of stuff which I already broke quite a few things. So thank you Mammoth for that and thank you for everyone who supported me via donations. It helps a lot. If you want to do that, here is the link. If not, see you in the next video and enjoy climbing.